I've had the privilege of working with residents for almost 20 years now, and one of the top things that's influenced teaching a lot compared to 20 years ago has been the substantial growth in clinical volumes. Since our teaching efforts are often constrained by our clinical responsibilities these days, it's really important that we use the time we have with our residents in the reading room as thoughtfully and as effectively as we possibly can. If you ask me what my teaching goals are, I believe that teaching residents the skills they'll use every day for the rest of their careers is my primary goal. Imparting information is an important but secondary goal. There are just so many excellent and instantly accessible sources of information besides me that are available to residents these days. That said, information is constantly changing in medicine and residents will need to continuously acquire new knowledge to succeed in their futures. So it is important that we emphasize how to approach, organize and acquire new information. If teaching skills is going to be our primary goal, what are those skills? I think there are five major ones. Number one, the technical aspects of imaging studies, how we do an imaging exam and why we do it that way. Number two, recognizing abnormal imaging findings. Obvious abnormalities are easy to spot and don't require much teaching. However, being able to distinguish normal findings that simulate disease from subtle abnormalities that might appear unremarkable is one of our toughest jobs as radiologists. Number three, interpreting abnormal imaging findings. If we recognize an abnormal imaging finding, we need to understand what it means. We need to characterize it, establish a reasonable diagnosis or differential diagnosis for it, and appreciate its clinical relevance in the context of the patient and their clinical setting. We do this with the insight that atypical presentations of common diseases occur much more often than typical presentations of uncommon diseases, and the knowledge that more than one abnormal imaging finding will often be present. Usually the majority of abnormal imaging findings will be linked to a common underlying cause. However, if the abnormal imaging findings are common ones, there's a realistic chance that they could be occurring independently. Number four, making the appropriate recommendation based on our assessment. This requires us to be familiar with existing management guidelines and the scientific evidence, in addition to experience and the wisdom of understanding that sometimes doing nothing may be the most appropriate recommendation. Number five, effectively communicating our assessment and recommendation to the referring provider and sometimes the patient themselves. That includes writing clear and succinct reports and impressions as we discussed in our radiology reporting talk. It also means knowing when we should make direct contact with the patient's referring provider, such as in the setting of an emergency funding or an unexpected life-threatening chronic one. Whenever I need to make sure I'm not neglecting one of these five goals, all I need to do is to peek at a standard CT report template in PowerScribe and look at the section headings. Technique findings, impression, recommendations, communication. In my opinion, the toughest of these five skills to learn and consequently the ones I try to spend most effort teaching are recognizing abnormal imaging findings and interpreting them. These are complicated tasks that involve deep understanding, critical analysis and complex concepts for which teaching by the Socratic method can be really effective. So instead of providing information directly to the resident, we ask a series of questions to stimulate their critical thinking and 
and encourage them to explore ideas. And in the process, we'll also get a good gauge of their knowledge. In other words, it's teaching by asking questions. The questions we ask will mimic our own perceptual and cognitive tasks when reading an imaging study, seeing the abnormal finding, characterizing the abnormal finding, establishing a ranked differential diagnosis, and understanding its clinical relevance. When approaching the task of seeing abnormal imaging findings with a resident, begin with a general question. What do you see? And wait for the response. If they don't mention the abnormal imaging finding, tell them that they missed an abnormal finding and wait. If the resident doesn't find it, tell them what organ or structure it's in and wait. If they still don't find it, point it out to them. When it comes to normal findings that simulate disease, be sure to ask the resident about anything you come across that initially bothered you, but you ended up dismissing as normal. If it was something that gave you pause, it could have easily tripped up a resident. Also emphasize the wisdom of the 5% rule. Most definitions and concepts of normal are based on Gaussian distributions and what's within two standard deviations of the mean. That means that 5% of the time, something normal may not fit within our concept or definition of normal. After the resident sees the abnormal imaging finding, their next task is to describe it and categorize it into a particular imaging pattern or bucket. If they don't, ask how they would describe the abnormal imaging finding and wait. If they don't describe it correctly or specifically enough, offer them a list of options to choose. If they don't choose the right imaging pattern, ask about particular characteristics of the abnormal imaging finding that indicate what its pattern is. Once the resident correctly recognizes the imaging pattern that the abnormal imaging finding belongs to, their next task is sharing an appropriate differential diagnosis. If they don't volunteer one, ask them for it. If they're unable to offer one, tell them the differential diagnosis and share how you use pathophysiology or memorization to remember it in the future. Then discuss ranking the differential diagnosis. Ask them what's most likely if they don't volunteer that. And if the resident doesn't seem to know, ask them questions about the factors you used to decide what was most likely, like imaging factors, clinical setting, patient demographics, and the statistics. Ask the resident, what does this diagnosis or differential diagnosis mean? If they don't seem sure of the clinical relevance, ask them questions directed as to why it's significant. One question I might ask is, what would happen if we missed this diagnosis? Senior residents and fellows will often have the correct answers to our questions, but may not actually know why. So be sure to challenge their answers from time to time. Ask them to explain the logic for their answer. Then propose something seemingly logical, but incorrect. Mix in correct answers sometimes too, just to keep them honest. Residents who understand the rationale behind a correct answer will usually be able to deflect your challenge. Residents who don't understand the rationale may get confused and be misled, which provides a nice opportunity to discuss the true rationale. This will be great practice for real life when referring providers may approach them and suggest alternate diagnoses or explanations for imaging findings that may be incorrect. The bottom line is that the skills required to be a good student are not the same skills required to be a good teacher. Being a great student does not guarantee you'll be a great teacher. It's something that requires effort regardless of what kind of student we were. But it also means that it's within anyone's reach to be a great educator if you choose.